drawing and naming molecules. Small inorganic molecules are named based on their molecular formula, usually using the most electronegative atom last. And then we use prefixes that denote the number of atoms. For example, dinitrogen tetroxide is a molecule with two nitrogens and four oxygens. But most of the molecules that we're going to be coming across are organic molecules. These are carbon-based molecules. The organic in organic chemistry has nothing to do with organic as it's used in a food or product label. It just means that there are carbon-hydrogen bonds present in the molecule or that there's a significant extent of carbon-carbon bonding. Carbon usually forms four very strong bonds, so organic molecules can get very complex. It is this complexity that allows the chemical diversity necessary for life as we know it. Common names and abbreviations, as shown for the structures here, are often the fastest way to talk about complex organic molecules. But the names themselves contain limited or no structural information about the molecules themselves. There are two other languages that people use to communicate about organic molecules. There are systematic names and symbolic structures. Actually, these structures shown on this slide are these symbolic structures that I'm talking about. These are rudimentary structures. They're representations of the structures of the molecule that are not necessarily accurate, but are symbolic. They represent this molecule. To save time, we don't explicitly draw any of the carbons or the hydrogens bound to them. Instead, we just draw the bonds between carbon atoms the carbons themselves are represented by the vertices, the angles between the bonds that are drawn. And we assume that there are as many hydrogens on each of the carbons as is required to bring the total number of bonds to four. For instance, a carbon with three bonds drawn to it explicitly has to have one hydrogen on it. A carbon with only one bond drawn explicitly to it has three hydrogens on it. These chemical structures, or glyphs, if you will, really do represent a language. And this language is much more efficient in representing the complexities of molecules than spoken or written word ever could be. That said, you can't say a structure. And we do need a way to talk about these molecules, both in spoken and written forms. We focus a large extent on the structure of the carbons in the organic molecule. One form they can come in is chains. Again, we use prefixes to indicate the number of atoms in this chain. You'll see here the first four, meth, eth, prope, and bute, make very little sense, and these are derived from archaic words. From five and up, we're back to using the familiar prefixes for the numbers pent, hex, oct, dec, etc. And you see some examples here just as the chain length increases and I have some examples here both words and structures for the different molecules that are based on these carbon chains. Now these carbon chains are the backbone of the molecule. Here, we're looking at a five carbon chain, so we're using the prefix pent. The suffix is determined by the number of double bonds or triple bonds in the molecule. For instance, all the way on the left, pentane, we use the suffix ane to mean that there are no double bonds. If we move over, we see one double bond, pentene. Now, if there were two double bonds, this would be pentadiene, or if we can't really do it with pentane, but you could have triene, tetraene, pentaene, etc. Now we also need to specify the geometry of these double bonds if they're internal 
to the chain. If they're on the end, as in pent one in, we don't need to say anything. If they're on the inside, there are two different geometric forms, the e and the z, and that needs to be reflected in the name. We use the suffix ein to indicate a triple bond. Again, the triple bond can be at the end or in the middle of the chain, but unlike the double bond, triple bond has only one geometric form, it's perfectly linear, so we don't need to use any extra terminology. Once the backbone is defined, we can start talking about substitutions, decorations on the side. So we can have a 2-bromopentane, where we have to indicate where the substitution is. 2-chloropent1-ene, you still need to contain all of the information about the backbone when you add the information about the substituents. Now, some of the substituents that can be added onto these chains are denoted by using a suffix in the name. For instance, going from octane to octanol, or octan 3 all, if the hydroxy group is in the third position. Octanoic acid, octanitrile, these substituents typically are important to the function of the molecule and are therefore more important. This means that they also determine the numbering scheme that's used in the chain. Typically, you would choose to count from whichever end minimizes the numbers that you're using for counting. For instance, one bromooctane if you put the bromo on the very end, rather than eight bromooctane. But when the numbering scheme is determined by the functional group, the substituent that's used in the suffix, then the bromo group at the very end is going to be 8, whether or not it's the lowest number available for counting. In addition to chains, we can also have carbon-based rings. And we just add the prefix cyclo. So just like a three-carbon three, cha a three -carbon chain is propane, a three-carbon ring is cyclopropane. And we have cyclobutane, cyclopentane, cyclopentene, when you have a double bond. Now I just want to point out, unless you have a very large ring, you're not going to have an E-type double bond, so it is often not specified. We also don't have to specify the number of the bond, where the double bond is, because any rotation of this molecule is going to end up being the same structure. And we can decorate these rings as much as we want. We still have the cyclooct in the name, but here I have Z4-propyl cyclooct 3-enone. Kind of a mouthful. Some rings have special names, benzene, pyridine, thiophene, furan, and these are included in the names as well. When you only have one substituent on benzene, you don't need to specify where it is. Again, rotation makes all the different ones about the same. So we have benzene and nitrobenzene. As soon as there are multiple substituents, their relative placement is very important. So we have to distinguish between 1,2-dinitrobenzene and 1,4-dinitrobenzene. These molecules, these isomers, are different compounds and have different properties. Rings containing atoms other than carbon, heteroatoms, are usually named using that heteroatom as position 1. For instance, 2,5-dimethylpyridine, or any of these pyridines. And you can see that substituents can be, as before, we saw heteroatoms like bromo or nitro groups. You can also have chains and rings and pretty much anything that you want as a substituent. One note on drawing the structures, they're usually drawn flat, but sometimes it's necessary to demonstrate some relative orientation in 3D space. And for this, we use wedges and dashed bonds. The wedges indicate that whatever is on the wider end of the wedge is coming out. With the dashes, it's a little counterintuitive, but again, 
the substituent on the wide end of the bond is going back. So these different cyclohexane diols on the top row, the ring is entirely in the plane of the screen, and the alcohol, the hydroxy groups, OH, are either in front or behind the screen, as indicated here. We also have a special way of drawing these cyclohexyl rings in the so-called chair configuration, as shown on the bottom row. Each column of structures are identical.